Thank you very much. Uh, what will I talk about today is, um, well, a summary of um, works in the topic of uh, the approach um, using the Batalin Vilkovisky and Batalin Fratkin Vilkovisky formalism to general relativity. So I will start by motivating uh, what we are trying to do uh, and how. And I will introduce uh, what we call the extended BVBFV formalism, which we have seen in part uh, with uh, Alberto's talks. Um, and uh, I will also comment on um, a notion, the notion of equivalence of field theory uh, in the BV formalism and how this becomes relevant when talking about general relativity. Uh, I will provide uh, kind of a simple but central example uh, of what I will say later in more complicated examples, which is a version of uh, classical mechanics, which is reparameterization invariant. Um, then I will go to the serious stuff, uh, talking about the Einstein-Hilbert theory, phrasing it in the batalin vilkovsky formalism with boundary, so uh, treating it in this way. And I will uh, discuss uh, another formulation of uh, gener general relativity that goes under the name of Palatini Cartan or Einstein Palatini Cartan. Einstein Cartan has many names. Um, and this will once again uh, raise the question of uh, equivalence of theories in this uh, extended uh, language. Uh, finally, if I have time, I will discuss um, an application of techniques by uh, AKS um, to what can be thought of a reconstruction of a bulk theory starting from boundary data. Uh, this you have seen actually in um, uh, Catania's talks, especially yesterday, we've seen exactly uh, this applied to um, mechanics with constraints, and I will do this for general relativity. And finally, I will comment on other models and outlook of this uh, research. Okay, so let me start by uh, defining uh, what we're trying to do. Um, so as you know, uh, the physical data for Lagrangian field theory uh, can be encoded, can be thought of as being encoded by the solutions of the other Lagrange equation for, uh, for the model. Uh, module the action of a symmetry group. Here, of course, I'm being restrictive, but it's just to fix the ideas. And what we wish to do is to integrate over, in case of quantization, or more generally describe the space of um, quotient, th this quotient space. So historically, we have seen that, okay, one method to do this is uh, through the fadeyev popov uh, trick, which realizes uh, this quotient uh, by means of a section. And uh, in order to do so, introduces ghost fields, so Grassmann-valued uh, fields on, on your manifold, um, which were later inter interpreted uh, by BRST as the generators of the algebra cohomology. Essentially, what uh, this method is doing is um, giving a cohomological interpretation or cohomological description to the space of invariant functions uh, over your manifold. Uh, later, Batalin and Vilkovsky generalized this to uh, more general symmetries, uh, although we will not talk about this point so much. Um, and it was realized that their method also gives a cohomological description of the critical locus of the action, so the space of solutions uh, of your variational problem. Now, alternatively, what you could do is um, try to describe your theory, your physical data, using uh, the physical or reduced phase space, so in a Hamiltonian formulation. Uh, and uh, as we have seen in several of the talks this week, this can be thought of as the coisotropic reduction or the symplectic reduction um, of the zero locus of a set of constraints inside a um, symplectic manifold. So here you can also 
utilize cohomological methods to define or replace the space of the, the functions over this reduced phase space, which is usually singular, um, with a cohomology of a complex, and this will be the BFD complex. So the idea is that while uh, the batalyan vilkovsky uh, formalism is a model for the Lagrangian field theory that you associate to a bulk, uh, BFV is a model for its Hamiltonian formulation, which you can think of as being associated to the boundary. And what I will try to convince you of as well uh, is that linking these two model models explicitly will give uh, some insight on quantization with boundary and uh, on the equivalence of theories. Okay. So once again, um, if we are given a classical field theory, there are two things we can do. Um, we can look at the moduli space of Euler-Lagrange equations, so uh, equations of motion modulo symmetries, and uh, we can use this batalyan vilkovsky procedure to construct a complex. Um, but uh, on the other hand, we can also uh, extract Hamiltonian information out of this Lagrangian field theory and uh, construct its um, BFV complex, which is, as I said, the reduction of the associated constraint Hamiltonian system. So if you think about quantization, the quantization of the bulk data, the Lagrangian field theory, should give you a description of uh, on-shell gauge invariant observables for the theory, whatever that means. Um, and uh, on the other hand, the BFV quantization, was there a question? No. Um, should give you a complex of states. So instead of simply the uh, quantizing to, to a Hilbert space, you get a complex, and the cohomology in degree zero of that complex should be your Hilbert space of states. So if you are on a manifold with boundary instead, uh, well, you can think of associating um, a BV complex to your bulk or your, the interior of your manifold, and a BFV complex to the boundary. And you say that you have a BV-BFV theory if the data satisfies certain compatibility conditions, which, okay, this is a black box for a lot of stuff, but uh, the idea is that inside this relation between what you associate to the bulk and what you associate to the boundary, there are uh, both classical and quantum relations. Why is this interesting? Well, um, maybe more in um, mathematical circles, but the idea is that uh, we want to think of quantization as a functor between two categories, okay? That doesn't mean anything. Uh, it's, let's say, it's, it's a mathematical program to um, associate to, to a theory uh, to, to know what to do in, when you're trying to quantize a theory. And this should be, somehow functorially dependent on uh, your space times, essentially. And this should come with a compatibility with cutting and gluing. So if you have a very complicated manifold, you cut it into pieces, you quantize the pieces, and you glue it back together. Um, and uh, the point that maybe I will focus on more is uh, this five. Uh, this also will clarify and refine the notion of classical equivalence in field theory. Uh, which is lifted to being a quasisomorphism not only of the complexes, but also of their BFE counterpart and the relation. Okay, so um, let's be a bit more specific. Um, so for us, a Lagrangian field theory is a space of fields, an action functional, and okay, a Lie algebraid, this is mildly general. Um, we want local symmetries to be described by this Lie algebraid, which is a vector bundle with an anchor map. If you don't know what this is, you have to think about a Lie algebra action. Uh, so where A will then become uh, your Lie algebra times FCL, and uh, the anchor is given by the, uh, the action. So um, we can construct a space of BV fields by essentially 
adding uh, additional graded fields, uh, so ghosts in degree one and higher, and uh, anti-ghosts and anti-fields in negative degree. Formally, you do this. Uh, of course, this is restrictive for those who uh, know what I'm talking about, but um, that's the gist. Um, then you want to construct a cohomological vector field, so a vector field that squares to zero, and it is of degree one, um, on this extended space of fields, which essentially, okay, is here complicated words. So this, you take the Lie algebraic differential, you just lift it to the cotangent bundle, and you add the Kosul differential, essentially. This, in general, is more complicated, again, but you can, you can fix the ideas thinking about um, this construction. I'm sorry, you do not distinguish between finite dimensional and infinite dimensional. This, this is infinite dimensional. Infinite dimensional, yeah. okay. It's not Lo this, everything is local. Right. Pardon? No problem with algebraics, so. No, I mean, T star, the, it, T -star is defined uh, as the density value section of the dual bundle, for example. Everything is local. So uh, you then define the BV action um, in this way. So you pull back the classical action, and then you look at um, the chevalier eilenberg uh, sorry, the uh, algebraic um, differential as a function in here. Uh, and you can prove that this satisfies the classical master equation. This, I mean, nothing new here. This is very standard uh, construction. Um, and then you say, okay, your BV theory is specified by this uh, four tuple of data. What it achieves is that, okay, if you define the BV complex to be a space of functions over this graded manifold with Q as its differential, um, the cohomology, cohomology degree zero will give you the space of invariant functions on, on shell, so on the critical locus. Um, on the other hand, as I said, you can do something else. Um, you can uh, extract out of a Lagrangian field theory, you can extract the data of a constrained Hamiltonian system. You can choose your favorite way to do so. You can use uh, Dirac formalism, as was discussed today, or there are methods by Kijovsky and Tulchiev, which uh, we use extensively. Um, and the idea is that you have a symplectic manifold um, that, okay, in this case is associated to the boundary, uh, and a submanifold inside, which is coisotropic. We denote by uh, curly uh, IC the vanishing ideal, which means the common zero locus of a set of constraints. The uh, BFV machinery, you turn the crank and similarly produces a graded symplectic manifold, which is an extension of this one, uh, which is also endowed with a cohomological vector field and a Hamiltonian function. So the function S partial satisfies the classical master equation. Now it should be noted that now this function for degree reasons will have to have degree one. Um, and the BFB complex, once again, uh, is the space of functions over this graded manifold with differential and its cohomology in degree zero will yield a resolution of the reduced phase space. So space of functions over the reduced phase space is seen as the cohomology in degree zero of this complex. So the question that we're asking ourselves is can we relate these two constructions? And the answer is often yes. So we um, assume that we have the data uh, of a BV theory. And we are working on a manifold with boundary. So first of all, we want to define what we call the space of pre-boundary fields. And this is just space of restrictions of field and normal jets to the boundary hypersurface. And this comes with a surjective submersion uh, which we denote by, by tilde. 
Now, this is also very well known. Uh, when you integrate by parts, uh, you always get boundary terms, and this is no different in the case of BV theories and BV action functionals. So uh, this is very similar to what uh, Mark was talking about today. So if you are trying to um, find a vector field, a Hamiltonian vector field of a given function, and if you have um, higher co-dimension boundaries, then you will have to take care of um, the boundary terms. In this case, this is a one form on this so defined space F tilde. And uh, you can look for its um, associated two form, which in most cases, especially cases where uh, symmetries are non trivial, um, it will be degenerate. Okay, so this is constructed automatically given, given your, your action functional, and you, you know uh, that it is degenerate. Yes. My question, when you go from bulk to bulk, yes. you, you, do you put in one trivial bound? No. no, no other you just take normal jets to boundary. Yeah. That's right. Yes, thank you. This is an important point. So in all of this, there will be no boundary condition. So we're keeping boundary conditions free uh, and seeing what structures they, they generate, they give us. Yes. There is a time boundary. At the moment, I don't fix a metric, so it's just a topological boundary. Uh, and sorry, for definiteness and for simplicity, everything will be compact at the moment. So I'm not compact means, uh, I mean, closed and without boundary. Sorry. The boundary, sorry. <laughs> 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 uh, so, thinking about, uh, um, think about this. Actually, sorry. think about this, and then we want sigma to be closed and without boundary. Okay, so, there is no special infinity in your case. If you put that, that would be a special event if you put the metric on it, but otherwise, there is no boundary. To, there is no boundary to sigma. Yeah, for example, sigma is a, a closed and without boundary. Okay. But this will change soon, so just uh, bear with me. Um, okay, so the question here is. Is this uh, form presymplectic, by which we mean, does it have a regular kernel? Well, if it is so, then we can do a reduction by this kernel and define a space of boundary fields, which is this F partial, okay? So there is this non-trivial step. You go from your bulk fields to something intermediate, and then you project down to your space of boundary fields. If this is the case, then we say that the theory is one extendable, and we have the following uh, result that says that, okay, assuming that this is the case, um, and that the reduction is smooth, the, the theory is one extendable, meaning that, yes, sorry, it's uh, on the blackboard is only written that uh, it's M. A question. Apparently it's a question. Yeah, there is a question. Can anyone read it? So can you can you see if I write here and just rewriting what I wrote before? M is sigma cross zero one the interval. But of course, you can generalize this. Okay. Um, so, so what this means is that, um, well, we have a surjective submersion by composing these two maps. Uh, and the BV operator, this Q, projects to a cohomological vector field Q partial. Um, and there is a Hamiltonian functional for this um, uh, vector field. 
which satisfies the classical master equation. And the classical master equation in the bulk, remember this S is the BV action in the bulk, is spoiled now by a boundary term. Here there should be one half, sorry about that, uh, here. Uh, it's spoiled precisely by this Hamiltonian function here. Yes? Question, if, if, if I have in this situation sigma times the interval, if I just do usual like textbook Hamiltonization of my survey, construct uh, BFB complex out of this, at the same time do BV complex, which That's is correct. Correct. construct back, I'll just have all these relations. So it's a, just another point of view on the standard. No, you, what is not the, the, the map? This map might. This is the whole point of this uh, of the talk. This map has this non-trivial symplectic reduction. If you can do it, then it's a standard okay. thing. Okay. But by different okay. So that's the point. Um, okay. So if you can do this, then you have a BFP theory on on your boundary. Recall also, uh, Maxim, that uh, we want this to be symplectic. Okay, so this is a symplectic manifold. So the, there is an obstruction in doing this, uh, this procedure, which is the regularity of this uh, kernel, of the kernel of the induced to form, what we call the presymplectic to form. If its kernel is non-regular, then this cannot be done. Um, this uh, other remark instead relates to what we discussed today and, uh, well, if sigma now does have a boundary, well, this will no longer be true, this equation will no longer be true, and you will have some additional terms. So you can axiomatize this as follows. So let's take a manifold with corners now. Let's take a manifold that has higher codimension strata. Um, and uh, provide at every codimension the following set of data. You want a graded symplectic manifold of degree k minus one. You want an action functional of degree k, homological vector field, and these maps. Okay, these maps are a crucial part, such that you have the following compatibility. So this is what we was called modified classical master equation. And once again, the crucial requirement is that these are symplectic manifolds. Um, you obtain BV data if you speci specialize for k equals zero, uh, the BFV data for k equals one, and so on. And at every dimension, you have a complex um, which are related by these maps. Yeah. Is it the same alpha on the first point and the rest? Mm, this one? And... Yeah. yeah, so this alpha and this alpha are the same, just a different dimension. Okay, so the problem is that, again, these maps might not exist because they involve symplectic reduction, which might not be smooth. And uh, this is what we call the problem of extendability. Um, just very briefly on, on the idea of quantization, but okay, so here we'll not talk about this anymore. Um, if we have uh, an exact BV BFV theory, as we have seen yesterday, we want to choose a polarization and we want to try to quantize the boundary action to an operator, for example, through Schrodinger quantization. Then we have this assumption, this regularity assumption on the space of fields. And given that we have a BV Laplace and that we have managed to regularize the BV Laplace in some way on this space Y, uh, we obtain the modified quantum master equation, which we have seen yesterday, is a combination of the, uh, well, the BV Laplace plus this quantized boundary operator applied to uh, a state. But how, how do you construct BV Laplace in the infinite dimensional case? That was discussed yesterday. Yeah, I, I will same. not comment on that, but it's the same here. 
uh, I mean, there are there are many ways. If you want, you can. The, the the point is that this is a this is agnostic to the way that you want to construct the BB Laplacian. You can use uh, also perturbative algebraic quantum field theory to construct it if you want. Um, okay, so the key ingredient here, once again, is the compatibility between bulk and boundary, which allows you to write this equation. Um, and uh, again, it's required that we have a symplectic manifold of boundary fields and higher co-dimensions. Uh, okay, a uh, few words on equivalence in the BV setting. Well, um, if we have two classical Lagrangian field theories, uh, let's denote by di the image of the anchor, so the distribution that generates the symmetries. Um, the set of Euler Lagrange equation, the moduli space uh, is the set of Euler Lagrange equations modulo the symmetries. And we say that uh, the theories are classically equivalent if we can make sense of the statement. So if the moduli spaces are equivalent um, and well, okay, this probably doesn't make sense. Uh, sorry about that. And uh, if we have a model uh, for functions on the quotient, um, we want to be able to say that the functions, for example, over over this moduli space, um, yeah, this that's the point. So this uh, should not be curly. This should be EL. Um, in the BV formalism, this is the statement that the cohomologies uh, of the two BV complexes in degree zero, they coincide, they are isomorphic. So we can extend this notion by saying, well, not only the, the degree zero cohomology should be the same, but all cohomologies, for example. So if we have two complexes, uh, we require um, that, that there be a map uh, of complexes, a chain map, such that um, it is an isomorphism in cohomology. This is called a quasi-isomorphism. And additionally, because we want to remember our uh, data, uh, we require that the class of the symplectic form and of the action functional is preserved. So since there are uh, experts in the room, uh, I need to say that, of course, this extends to a density uh, form of, of the same statement. So you can take, um, if you work with the variation by complex, you can uh, work with uh, Deram, uh, BV Deram complex, and uh, you can make this into, into a statement about uh, Q minus D uh, uh, classes. Yes. Because there is a notion which definitely gives classical equivalence, which is related to the elimination of, of, of uh, generalized auxiliary field, mm -hmm. which is also a homological notion if you put it properly. Yes. And this guarantees in local setting isomorphism. Sure. I feel that it is a bit strict. Because when you, you know, just I talk sorry. about quasi quasi isomorphism you need to say in which because this is the infinite dimensional manifolds mm -hmm. it almost means nothing unless you really described uh, precisely which yeah, class yeah, of yeah. functions which class of I, because there are natural complexes of I don't know of course. forms vector yeah, yeah. I, I, here I just want to say that uh, within the standard setting that you you can do local field theory and you can look at um, the BV, uh, I mean, BV observables here are local functionals, then you can, you can think of extending this to densities. But I want to say it's the notion that extends, not necessarily the statement. That if you have a positive morphism, then it extends. I'm just saying the notion extends. Mm, to local, yes, but is it enough that all homology is isomorphic? make sure that everything you can imagine is isomorphic. This is very difficult. No, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. In fact, I think this is the point of the talk. I mean, this, this is one notion, and there might be you know, discrepancies, even if you have something of this type. 
Okay, let's, let's see. Maybe, maybe you were saying the same thing. Um, so let's look at an example to fix the ideas a little bit. Um, so we want to consider the following diffeomorphism invariant action, which is uh, Jacobi theory. So here Q is uh, a map from the interval into Rn, uh, and E is a constant, V is some potential, which okay, we can set to zero, doesn't really matter, and T is the uh, kinetic energy. Uh, so this is a form, uh, it's a way of writing classical mechanics that essentially um, stems from the abbreviated action and you can rewrite it as the length in some target metric. This is a reparameterization invariant and uh, we can show in, in a second that this theory is classically equivalent to a model where you couple one dimensional gravity to a scalar. This is the action. Um, G is a metric tensor on the line, on, on the interval. And by eliminating auxiliary fields, as you suggested, uh, we obtain uh, this classical equivalence. So you solve the equations of motion for the metric uh, and you obtain, um, you, you plug it into your action function or you obtain the um, Jacobi action. What happened to the square root in the first line of SJ? Uh, that is a good point. I, no, I mean, uh, yeah, so there, yeah, sorry, I might, yeah, maybe, maybe has disappeared. The point is that uh, you can write it as, as the, um, as the length in some, in some target metric. So um, the, the point here is that both theories are invariant under the action of uh, vector fields on, on the interval, on the line, uh, which is represented by uh, this um, algebraic differential, if you want. Uh, so we're acting on, on Q and G by lead derivatives in both cases. Um, and out of this, we can build the BV theory for uh, Jacobi and, and gravity. And the point is that we have shown that there exist two explicit, very explicit chain maps uh, that send one theory to the other, uh, such that their composition are homotopic to the identity, and as a consequence, um, the two theories are BV equivalent. Okay? This is not extremely surprising until I tell you uh, that while the gravity theory is one extendable to a BV BFV theory on a manifold width boundary, the Jacobi theory is not. Okay, so if you recall, there was a regularity requirement. Uh, and the, the problem here is that, that we see is that the kernel of the induced one form on, uh, on the boundary for Jacobi theory is not regular. So out of this, you, you conclude that obviously the regularity of this kernel is not preserved by quasisomorphisms. Can you explain this further? In which way? Uh, I, I can know, tell show, you, show, to show us these kernels. Uh, yeah, I mean, they're not very illuminating to be honest, but the point is that you have, um, so you have uh, equations for uh, odd variables that um, jump in dimension. So the solutions of those equations jump in dimension because you have relations between these odd variables that cannot be uh, resolved, essentially. Yes. Is this the condition that Dirac phrase that uh, the rank of the Poisson bracket of the constraint should be constant on the constraint surface? So that the number of first class and second class constraints is constant, I mean, the same everywhere. In I don't think so, because this happens before, before that, before um, restricting to the constraints of length. This is... Uh, no, I, I, yeah, but I you are discussing, but you have the reduced phase space somehow. Not yet, not, so, yet. not yet. So this would be, uh, so, 
Let me. Okay, so in in the space F curly partial, inside here, uh, there would be, well, this would be the Lagrangian bundle, let's say, of some space of classical fields on the boundary times something else. And in here, you want your quasi-tropics of manifold. The problem is that we cannot even build this one. Okay, so here, this comes from a map from the space of BB fields. And we cannot even construct this ambient space. What is this F hat D? Uh, this one is the would be the sorry. This would be the space of boundary fields. So that's not this is the pre-boundary module of this kernel. But it's already quotient. Yeah, this is the quotient. We cannot build this quotient. Because the form is not regular. This exactly. is a pre symplectic form. Exactly. So we have that this map is still structured. Almost normal jets. Pardon? Normal jets. Normal jets are usually are inside here. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, maybe I, there should be an example. So, um, okay. Let's let's look at uh, uh, the example here. Um, okay, so let, let me set the, the stage here. I will, for simplicity, consider again sigma cross zero one with sigma closed and without boundary. Uh, and I look at the algebra given by uh, the infinitesimal action of homomorphisms. This is the anchor, so I'm acting on metrics by the derivative. And I construct the BV theory, the BV space of fields, by taking the shift to cotangent bundle of this shift algebraic. This is what it is. So in the cotangent fibers, I'm putting anti fields and anti ghosts. Okay. Anti fields here, G dagger, this is just a uh, symmetric uh, inside and out ghosts. So these are PV1. This is the BV action for Einstein per theory. And uh, well, what we have shown explicitly is that this is one extendable uh, for all dimensions d greater than 2. Now, this again involves a non trivial symplectic reduction, but you have to show it. Um, and uh, the data, I will stop on this slide for a little bit because I think it's interesting. Uh, here's where things work. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the space of uh, boundary fields, the reduced, the one that is reduced by this kernel. Uh, and it is correctly the cotangent bundle of, of uh, metrics on, on sigma uh, with um, vector fields on sigma and functions on sigma. Now, um, this is the Q uh, that lives on the on the boundary. This is QBFV, and as you can see, it knows uh, about well the um, Hamiltonian vector fields of your constraints, your Hamiltonian constraint. Maybe I should first show it to you here, and your momentum constraint, which is written like that, but uh, it's the same. So uh, the action of Q on H is simply the Hamiltonian vector field of these two constraints. Same for, for pi. This is the um, Hamiltonian vector field. And then there is this additional term. Um, this has a um, Hamiltonian function which is given by this functional here, which as you can see is, well, the classical object. So the, the constraints smeared by, by functions as we've seen today, uh, plus uh, parts that depend on anti-fields and ghosts. And I want to focus your attention on this term because it's uh, particularly non-trivial. Uh, as you know, the bracket of 
sections of uh, of two um, Hamiltonian say two Hamiltonian constraints gives you a momentum constraint, and this is represented here. And the fact that this depends on H is uh, reflecting the fact that this is not Lie algebra in the sense that the structure constants are not constants. Uh, yeah. What's the uh, double? Um, um, yes. This one? Yeah. Yeah. This means that okay, this chi partial and this d xi n. This is a symmetric form, if you want. And but here I want a symmetric bivector, so I'm just raising indices using the metric. Oh, you mean it's just the musical oh, isomorphism okay. used twice. Okay. Um, so the immediate observation is that this uh, Q manifold given by the BFV data on your boundary is not a Lie algebra, is not a Lie algebraoid, it's an L infinity algebraoid. Um, it provides the resolution of the quasotropic vanishing locus of constraints. So uh, Hamiltonian and momentum constraints put equal to zero. Uh, and so in a way, it's a description of the reduced phase space. Um, and uh, let me also say that this, because of that red term before, this uh, uh, differential is not the sum of a Lie algebra differential and the Kosul differential like it happens in gauge theories. In most gauge theories, certainly everyone that I can think of right now, except maybe the Poisson Sigma model, uh, this is the case. In gravity, this is not. So in a way, this is telling you that you have a Hamiltonian system with symmetries on shell. This is interesting because, um, well, usually uh, we can think of the uh, set of uh, constraints as the pre-image of a moment map. And in this case, this is not possible, at least not yet. We don't have the notion. Um, okay, this is a very brief comment. I think I will just skip it, but the, just very briefly, the point is that quantizing this action here will give a higher version of the wheeler david equation, uh, wheeler david operator. And, uh, well, a state for, let's say, quantum gravity, whatever that means, uh, should be uh, in this BVBFV setting um, uh, um, annihilated by this operator. And if you only want to look at the equations that uh, happen on the boundary, these are some modifications, possibly of higher order in H bar of the Wheeler David equation. But, okay. Okay, so that was the example where everything works well. Uh, essentially, what Maxim was saying, you can uh, decide to don't do the bulk to boundary uh, induction procedure, just start with your constraint and construct uh, something, uh, some BFV complex using those constraints, and these two procedures should uh, coincide. This is an example where things don't work quite like that. Um, so we have seen um, a version of Palatini Kartan in uh, one of the talks this week. Um, again, just briefly, we have a manifold which is a cylinder and we take a Minkowski bundle. So we fix uh, let's say Minkowski space on, on every fiber. Um, and uh, we call Palatini Kartan theory, uh, the theory of a coframe, so a bundle isomorphism and uh, an SO31 connection omega given by this action function. The algebraoid in this case is um, given by, well, generators of gauge transformations and vector fields. Uh, and it acts by lead derivatives on the coframes, this kind of covariant lead derivative on the connections and uh, uh, gauge transformations um, as well. 
So you apply the machinery, this part is easy, uh, you uh, get the BV action. And now before uh, going to the extension, I want to do exactly what Maxime was suggesting. So let's take um, the space of boundary fields for this theory. Um, so we're taking um, the symplectic form that comes from this action functional has this form. Problem is that uh, here as well, this symplectic form is not um, non-degenerate. It has a kernel. In this case, the kernel is uh, regular. So we uh, could reduce, okay, so the classical space of boundary fields for palatinic Cartan theory is the quotient by the kernel of the symplectic form of the space of uh, tetrads on the boundary or field binds on the boundary and connections on the boundary. Okay? Notice that this reduction is non-trivial. Okay? So we're killing pieces of the connection. Uh, in fact, you can show that um, there exists a symplectic submanifold inside uh, this space, uh, which essentially provides a section of this reduction, so from F tilde to F partial. Um, and we say, okay, the fields in this submanifold have to satisfy what we call a structural constraint. Um, the result is that, okay, on this submanifold, which again is symplectomorphic to the reduced uh, space here, um, we have constraints, but notice that these are not the um, naive constraints that you would think on simply the space of restrictions of fields on the boundary, but they need to satisfy this structural constraint. Otherwise, they, they don't work. And uh, this is a coisotropic submanifold. If you're interested in the formulas, I have them somewhere. Yep. This structural constraint come from? Uh, good point. So this comes from um, the torsion uh, less condition, the omega e equals zero. But um, you see, the omega e is sort of here as well. The point is the following. In the bulk, e wedge the omega e equals zero is true if and only if the omega e equals zero. The same equation on the boundary where now I'm saying, I'm uh, stressing that I'm restricting to the boundary. Uh, this is no longer true. Okay. In fact, you need this additional um, this additional condition. So there is, the problem is that this map E boundary wedge dot. This has uh, very annoying kernels. And, uh, you know, for example, here you cannot just remove it. Um, okay, in, um, in dimension three, as you can see, this uh, constraint doesn't, doesn't exist, it doesn't um, appear. In fact, well, you can see it from here, this, this uh, form is symplectic. Okay, so we can uh, construct the BFV data out of um, the constraints that I uh, told you before. Uh, and you get, um, well, let's first consider this space. So this is the space of uh, field binds on the boundary, connections on the boundary, and something else. Okay, if you want, here's what the something else is. 
Um, now, recall that we have the structural constraint before this piece equals zero, sorry, in the image of uh, omega we. We need to extend this to a condition on this extended space, this graded manifold. And one way to do it, this is not unique, one way to do it is by picking, for example, this uh, combination. Notice that, of course, the restriction of this expression to the body of this graded manifold, so the uh, space of classical free boundary fields, is your original constraint. Uh, so then we define the space of BFV fields for Palatini Cartan as the space of solutions of this extended constraint. And this is again because of what uh, I said before, this is uh, symplectomorphic to the appropriate reduction that you would get. Um, Okay, let's uh, keep it there for a moment. So we know how to construct the BFV data for Palatini Cartan. Now let's try to compare these two models. So the two theories are classically equivalent and their BV cohomologies are related by the elimination of auxiliary fields. Um, practically, well, in Einstein-Hilbert, you have uh, the vanishing of the Einstein tensor and uh, in palatini cartan you have this two set of equations which as i just said here this means that uh, uh, this is a torsionless condition which means that omega is essentially levi civita and then when you put it back in this will give you um, the the Einstein tensor on the boundary we can phrase uh, a symplectic reduction with respect to uh, the generator of the uh, Lorentz constraints, which is the vanishing of, of this constraint here. Uh, sorry, the Lorentz transformation, which is the vanishing of this constraint. Um, and there is a symplectomorphism between the, uh, the reduced phase space with respect to this constraint and uh, the space of Einstein-Hilbert uh, boundary fields. So this tells us that classically, the two theories are exactly equivalent, okay? So classical fields in the bulk, classical fields in the boundary. And einstein Hilbert, they are related by elimination of generalized. Yeah, okay. Not only auxiliaries, you also need to fix Lorentz. Lorentz. In the which is algebraic. You're right. So I, I forgot to say. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay. Uh, however, they differ in their BV BFV behavior in the following sense. Um, so in three dimensions, Palatini Cartan theory can be extended to all co dimension strata. So if you are on a manifold with corners and boundaries of corners, so all the way down to points, um, the Palatini-Cartan BV theory that I described before um, extends uh, to every co-dimension. So you have compatible data at every stratum. In dimension higher than four, this is not true and it stops immediately. So you cannot extend it to the boundary using this uh, language, this formalism. Once again, the kernel of the um, now BV Resymplectic uh, form is not subbundled. Its rank is not constant. Once again, you have relations between um, odd fields. And if you think that the uh, equivalence of BV theories for Einstein, Hilbert, and Palatin Cartan gave you a quasi isomorphism, once again, we have seen before that the regularity of this kernel is not preserved by these quasi isomorphisms. Um, this, I, as far as I know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a claim. It's uh, still to be uh, verified and proven uh, bulletproof, but um, it seems that Einstein-Hilbert, while one extendable, it cannot be extended further, so to corners and higher. 
Um, so this tells us that while um, there is a BV theory and a BFB theory for palatinic and gravity in dimension higher than four, there seems to be no relation between them. So what is going on? Um, okay, so I will quickly conclude um, by saying what we can do by exploring uh, this idea of reconstruction using a KSC. Um, so as I said, you can, given, given a Lagrangian field theory, you can do your standard Lagrangian to Hamiltonian process, find a constrained Hamiltonian system, and using the independent uh, procedures, BV and BFV, you can obtain two uh, Q manifolds, two complexes. And if the theory is BV, BFV, then they are related. Um, however, if you are given a BFV structure, which is an example of a Hamiltonian DG manifold, you can use uh, the AKSZ construction and obtain a BV theory on a cylinder. And this was an uh, old remark. Uh, I think uh, Maxim has uh, studied this as well. The AKSZ um, theory that you get in this way will be compatible with this BVBFV construction automatically. However, the question is, how does this AKSZ constructed theory compare to the original one? Notice that, okay, you don't expect these two theories to to be the same in general because, okay, this is topological and this might not be. Um, okay, so here a brief, uh, I will recall very briefly, we've seen it yesterday. So we have uh, BFV data uh, and uh, we construct the space of fields by taking maps into it, which essentially means take new fields that are maps of the old ones plus one forms. Uh, you can construct an action functional. This is, okay, the abstract definition. This is the uh, concrete thing that you do. You evaluate your boundary action on these fields, which now will have a one form component. So you can integrate them over the interval and similarly for the one form. Um, then you know that this defines a BV theory. So the data defined like that. Uh, let's apply this to, to general relativity. What happens is that, well, uh, the, if you apply it to Einstein-Hilbert gravity, you get something which is BV equivalent to your original uh, BV theory for gravity, which I constructed before. This is not immediate. There is a, essentially what you get out of this is a first order version of that, but they are equivalent. But for palatini cartan gravity, the situation is very different. Uh, in fact, the output of this AKSZ construction is only included in the original one. It's smaller uh, and, uh, well, as I said, while the, the AKSZ construction for Einstein-Hilbert is a first order version of what we started from, um, in the case of palatini cartan this is significantly smaller. I mean, you have different space of fields. I will, uh, I will explain it. I will explain it. Thank you. Um, recall that the target of this AKZ construction for Palatini Cartan is a constrained submanifold, right? So it's this space of BFV fields that are solutions of this structural constraint. This is a symplectic manifold, so it qualifies for symplectic AKSC. Uh, since we are on cylinders, we have an interpretation. We can uh, decompose 
etrads on the cylinder as, as follows. So you define what is your uh, um, R direction. And you can define the space of reduced connections on a cylinder by using this decomposed tetrad, which is essentially is a sliced version of the reduction that happens on the boundary. Okay. Here, um, you also then have a structural constraint, which essentially is the structural constraint you had on the boundary, but on slices. Um, however, what's the problem? Here, again, this space is not a Q submanifold of the space of BV fields for palatinic Artan gravity. It's just a submanifold of the space of classical fields. Um, so what you need to find is a extension of this constraint that makes it into a Q submanifold of this original space of fields. And these are precisely given by this inclusion that we have found using the KSC construction. Um, so essentially, uh, the AKZ construction tells you what is the correct space of uh, fields inside, uh, wh what is the correct Q submanifold of this space of uh, palatinic Artan BV fields, which will work with the boundary, which will give a BV BFB theory. And in a way, it, so, sorry, how it, much more time do you need? I'm I'm done. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So let me just mention quickly that um, okay, I think this suggests at least that we need to refine what we mean by BV equivalence of theories, uh, because something non-trivial might happen on the boundary, and uh, there are other problematic models. Uh, one interesting one is the comparison between Dambugoto and Polyakov string, uh, where again, Polyakov is one extended and uh, uh, Nambugoto is not. And this is very much analogous to the 1D case that I described before. Uh, Plebansky theory is also not extendable, uh, which is a BF version of gravity. And the question that I'm interested in at the moment is whether this gives some semi-classically observable differences, for example, uh, asymptotically or at higher co-dimensions. Thank you. Sorry for going. Thank you. These questions? Thank you. Uh, yes, I have a question. So, to come back to the case of gravity to make sure I understood. So, in the case of the einstein hilbert formulation, you have both a BV formulation and a BFV formulation. They are equivalent. They are compatible. Compatible. And equivalent. I mean, and you can, that means, I guess, that they are uh, physically equivalent. Oh, yeah, maybe you can say it like, depends on yeah, okay. what you mean by physically uh, yeah. equivalent, I guess. So. <coughs> then you have the Palatini Carton formulation, the BV, you have the BV and the BFV. Now, I know that the BFV of Palatini Carton is equivalent to the BFV of Einstein formulation, and the two BVs are equivalent. Now, if this is equivalent to that, and this is equivalent to that, and this is equivalent to that, I would have the feeling that with a proper definition of equivalent. Exactly. So I think I think the point is that um, one needs to find the, the the right definition of equivalent. So if um, if we are interested in a realization of a model beside just its cohomology, then that might change. If you have a different realization, so for example, this uh, AKZ version might be totally fine. This might have already all of the information that we need. Um, so the question is, okay, you may know that the, the big theory, which is the naive theory that you would find, is in some sense the equivalent Einstein Hilbert. But 
there is a better realization, which is this one, which is BV equivalent to that one, most likely, and also BV BFV equivalent, in the sense that you also have a <laughs> means, roughly speaking, that there is a consistent natural way to restrict to the boundary BV structure to obtain the Yes. And of course, once it is Z, then it's just a pullback to the boundary, then it is by construction. Exactly. Uh, okay, so uh, as the input is not in the case of theory, so this is already not uh, absolutely trivial. And uh, the point is that quantization you want to do by keeping in mind what your boundary data is. For example, you might want to do effective quantization where you retain boundary fields. And in order to do that, you want to have this BV BFB uh, relation. So uh, if, if you start from this one, which might be maybe it's just a convenient uh, realization of the theory for a certain point of view, maybe this is not the right realization if you're interested in quantizing with the boundary, for example. It's all about that. So it's all about what is the better realization and what is the um, invariant object when looking at things with boundary that we want to retain. Uh, maybe the, the, the cohomology with zero is not enough, as you were saying. Maybe you want all cohomology, you also want the boundary, you want some relation. Yes. Oh, questions? Yeah, maybe but partly question, partly comment. So in principle, the, what you can do in any Lagrangian BV theory, you can represent as an isomorphism invariant, then it is strictly a KZ sigma again, Lagrangian B. Mm -hmm. Of course, with infinite dimensional target, but countable is originate. Mm -hmm. Because I'm talking about logs and sort of just once it is a KZ, you can pull it back to the bound. Yes. And this will be in your language BV BFV yes. Then you can eliminate the various transformation and obtain what is this. So you, you, you do have, it is known in the literature, how to do uh, the map from the structure of the bulk <coughs> to the structure of the bound. Mm -hmm. And it is constructed. Of course, it's still a lot of work to really go to the very... I don't know. I think if you if you naively start from here, you don't know what to do, and then you're blocked. I mean, no, I do. I do know. I just lift it to a KZ and pull back. I'm done. Okay, we can talk about that. <laughs> yeah? Uh, so, maybe I'm a little bit confused, but I'm, I'm trying to understand uh, uh, where the... Uh, uh, the source of the incompatibility between, uh, say, the um, Palatini Cartan and Einstein Hilbert formulation of gravity is. is it related to, to those, uh, say, tetrad configurations that are degenerate that don't correspond to any metric? Uh, sorry, those configurations? So, uh, in Palatini Cartan, you have the, the tetrad or the frame and the connection, but uh, you, you can have uh, frames or collections of vector fields that, that uh, don't form a basis. So they don't correspond to any metric. Are, are these kind of degenerate no, no, no. configurations that are okay, responsible? So, <clears throat> um, okay, I should say that, okay, here we are always assuming that okay, this tetrad is non-degenerate and also the y is restricted to the boundary is non-degenerate. So that's not, that's, it's not there, at least as far as I understand. Um, it is more related to uh, here. The, you are considering too many connections, too many uh, connection fields. And so when you're looking at Palatine so it seems that the, the right thing to do is to pre-reduce the space of, of, uh, of connections already in the bulk. This, for me, is important because, you know, if the quantization explores what happens outside of the critical locus, then you know, have a different uh, local space and, you know, you, you, you're counting things that maybe you shouldn't be counting. Um, 
the, the what, what this construction seems to be saying is that everything works if you start from your connections and you reduce them. You take only those that are not in the kernel of the sample. So what was W? W is uh, simply wedge with E, which now you do at every slice if you're in a cylinder. So imagine that you have so omega is an object uh, that has two internal indices. In, it's in wedge two uh, of, of B, which you can identify with the early algebra. And so, um, well, actually, the better way to do this calculation is this. So you take E as a basis, so you expand only the basis, then you take um, this operation and you set it to zero. So you wedge with E, and this will give you a trivial kernel. So those components of omega that satisfy this equation, you want to remove. And these are connections on the sigmas. Yeah, so uh, this, these connections are on steam across I, but if you are on a cylinder, you can make sense of, of this condition where E is the tangential part of the tetra. Then there is another question is, okay, if you're not on a cylinder, how do you make sense of this? And this we still don't know. But, uh, there seems to be something to be done with the connections uh, before any. As far as I know. Yes, I Well, maybe try to comment. Connect it with this. I know that in if you are in four dimensions in higher, contrary to three dimensions, and if you do the Hamiltonian analysis, you will get a mixture of first class and second class constraints in the Palatini Carton formulation. And I was wondering, I'm, I think it looks very much like what you are explaining. Yes, so this uh, in, indeed seems related. Uh, but um, I don't have a definite answer. It, it, it should be related in some sense, but it's not clear. Uh, we are using, we're not using the Dirac method here. I understand, but uh, uh, it might be some exactly translation of that phenomenon. There is some translation there, that's true. 